Hey everyone, welcome to section 3.3 where we're going to be talking about Merkle trees. Now we had a bit of an oversimplification in the past few lectures. We talked about hashing all of the transactions of a block together with a previous block hash and a nonce in order to get the block hash. So we have this block of a bunch of transactions uh, in Bitcoin. Each block has around 2,000 transactions. And in total, these 2,000 transactions will take up one megabyte of space. So one might wonder, why don't we just remove all of these transactions, have this zero megabyte block, and then when we hash the transactions together with the nonce in the previous block hash, it'll be faster to compute block hashes because we'll have to hash one megabyte less data each time. So we obviously don't want to incentivize our miners to not include transactions. One solution is to first hash all the transactions together, and this will give us a transaction hash, in this case 06B06. And then, in computing our block hash, we just hash this transactions hash together with a nonce and the previous block hash. So no matter whether you include 2,000 transactions or zero transactions, your transactions hash will always be 256 bits. So all we're hashing together while we're mining is a transactions hash, a nonce, and a previous block hash. And we call all these items together our block header. Uh, so really, we're not getting a hash of all of the contents of the block, we're just getting a block header hash. But Bitcoin doesn't actually just use a hash of transactions. Consider the following example. Let's say we have this tan gerbil that only has a smartphone and wants to connect to the Bitcoin network in order to sell music. So our tan gerbil will connect to Alice and connect to Jing as peers. And Alice wants to buy some music. So now Alice has to send proof to the tan gerbil that she paid her on the Bitcoin blockchain. So tan gerbil is going to ask, did Alice pay me for this song? And is going to open up the packet that Alice sent and see thousands and thousands of transactions that her smartphone now has to hash to verify. And her smartphone, which is very bad at computing hashes, will not hold up. But don't worry, Merkle trees to the rescue! Shout out to Ralph. So rather than just hashing our transactions to get this transaction hash that we include in our block header, let's instead use what's called a Merkle tree. And we start off with our thousands of transactions, only some of which are listed here, and we'll first hash each transaction. So we'll hash this transaction of Alice sending money to Jing, and we'll get this hash of 54D3, and each transaction will point to its hash. And we'll take each pair of hashes, and we will hash them together. So we'll hash 54D3 together with 86D3. And the resulting hash will be the parent of those two hashes. And we'll make our way up the tree, hashing each pair of hashes together in order to create a new parent hash. And finally, once we only have these two parent hashes, we will hash those two together in order to get our root hash, which is also called a Merkle root. Now, if Mallory wants to tamper with this Merkle tree and change this transaction from her sending money to Bob to her sending money to herself, well, it's going to change the hash of her transaction. And of course, when you hash that transaction together with 174F, it's going to change their parent hash. And now when you hash D871 together with 5DC3, you're going to get a different parent hash again. And these changes are going to propagate all the way up to the Merkle root, and everyone will be able to verify that something changed in the tree. Ha! Nice try, Mallory. But you know, you could have done the same thing with a transactions hash, right? Like if someone changed a transaction and then we hashed it all together, the transactions hash would be different as well. So how is this any better than a transactions hash? Well, let's think about our buddy Tan Gerbil here. In order to verify that Alice's transaction to him is valid, rather than having to hash thousands of transactions together, all she needs to verify Alice's transaction to her is to hash it, hash it together with its neighboring hash, hash that resulting hash with its neighboring hash, and hash that hash together with its neighboring hash all the way until we get to the Merkle root. And if all these hashes check out, Tangerable will be able to verify that Alice's transaction to her is valid. And this small set of hashes that allows this tan gerbil to verify that this transaction is valid is called a Merkle proof, or a Merkle branch. So let's run this scenario again. Alice wants to buy some music from tan gerbil, and so Alice will send tan gerbil this message. And rather than all of those thousands of transactions that she sent before, she'll just send tan gerbil this one transaction and three hashes. Tan gerbil will hash this transaction to get 5A62, and we'll hash those two hashes together to get B14F. We'll hash those two transactions to get F660. And we'll hash those two hashes together in order to get 2D49. 
And now all Tangerable has to do is check that 2D49 is in fact the Merkle root in the block header, which checks out. And now Tangerable just has to do one more hash, hashing this Merkle root together with the nonce and the previous block hash to verify that yes, the block header hash is valid and has enough leading zero bits. Now the amount of data that you'll need to hash in order to verify a Merkle proof, rather than having to verify all the transactions in a block, goes up logarithmically with the number of transactions in a block. So in an extreme example where we have 65,000 transactions per block, the approximate size of that block will be 16 megabytes. But the size of our Merkle path, or our Merkle proof, is only 512 bytes. This means we have to hash 30,000 times less data and our tan gerbil can verify that the transactions that she cares about are included in the blockchain and doesn't have to worry about all the other transactions. And this is what's called running a light client, uh, sometimes also referred to as a thin client, or in Bitcoin, a simple payment verification client. Although our tan gerbil here is not verifying the validity of the entire blockchain, as long as she trusts the block headers that she's getting, she can verify that the transactions that she cares about are included in that chain. So next up, we're going to take a step back from the nitty gritty technical details of Bitcoin and analyze the game theory of Bitcoin, where we'll be introducing some basic game theory concepts and analyzing the game of mining in Bitcoin. Look forward to seeing you there.